Daniel chapter 7. I need to ask you before we go any further to be praying tomorrow, especially for Mr. Marvin Tetherow. And he's 77 years of age. It's Kerry Sunheimer's dad. He's been on a breathing machine for a couple of weeks or better. And uh, they refused to do the surgery, refused to do the open heart surgery. He has a ruptured artery. He's got something ruptured. Uh, valve. Ruptured valve. It was leaking and is now ruptured. Uh, and he has no chance of making it without the surgery. And they were going to do it Thursday, and the surgeon making it through the surgery. They had to clear his lungs up a little bit, get uh, his kidney, kidneys functioning a little bit better. And I believe the surgery is scheduled for tomorrow. Since Thursday, his condition's been up and down. So it's a touch-and-go thing. Mr. Tetherow's surgery is scheduled, as far as we know, for sometime tomorrow. Also, Eva Albrecht, a lady that's uh, struggling in a major way, needs your prayers. Her family does also. Hazel will have some surgery tomorrow on her wrist. Uh, be praying for her. Need to be uh, also remembering Kim and Ruth Ann, child delivery inside two weeks, more than likely. All right, I've also asked you to remember uh, to pray for Uncle Emil, be Becky's uncle, Lydia's brother, open heart surgery scheduled for him. And uh, talk to Ralph Linder about buying some property to the north yesterday. Uh, so you might pray about that. Will the Lord be done? We, I've always told we don't covet anything anybody has. Uh, but if there should be a need there, uh, then uh, the Lord will have to work it out. Perhaps maybe this will work out. So if you would, pray about that as well. Tonight, uh, today being Missionary Sunday, I'm also going to ask you tonight to vote on adding Steve Donnelly, uh, which would be Arctic Alaska, Wayne Fair, back to Papua New Guinea uh, in a couple of months to the mission family. You can, you'll have a vote like I'll have one vote. Uh, Lee Graham, not sure what to do there. Joe West will offer explanation there as well. Okay, and just to say that each one here is appreciated, visitors, regular church folks as well. Daniel chapter 7 now, verse number 9. Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. And the books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, and glory, and the kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Lord, another time, God, we bow before you. And God, we ask that your blessing would be upon what is said. And God, I want to preach the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And God, I pray you would enable me to speak well, right, the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God today. Lord, a very important message. And God, I'm sure it's what you wanted. Help me to preach it right. Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He's able to go in every heart and work and deal and convict and give comfort. God, you know the need. I ask you to work. Work on me as well. I ask it in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. This message that I'm going to preach this morning I call, I'm so happy and here's one reason why. I can't tell you how happy I am in the Lord. There really aren't any words to express it. I can attempt, but you never quite get it covered. I'll simply say this, the Lord's certainly been good to me. 
far better than I deserve. I cannot thank the Lord enough for saving my wretched soul. Can't thank Him enough. Can't love Him enough. He's a wonderful, wonderful Savior. I can't tell you the joy that God's given. I offered explanations somewhat in the last couple, three weeks or so. Been very enjoyable. The Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters after many days. It will return unto you. And it's been a special blessing. Those that have come back around, such as Gene, family, Carl's button acquaintance, know him a little bit better now. And a lot of pleasantries. I like them all. Take every one. I'm like you. More. I want more. The Lord's certainly good. Isaiah said one time, he said, I'm drinking from the wells of joy, the wells of salvation. They're wells of joy. I'd have to say, you got it. You got it, fella. You got it. I'd have to say that I have never run across anything like it in my life, being saved. I'd tell you that. I'd tell anybody else that. I don't care who you are and I don't care who they are. They're just nothing like it. I've got the main thing covered. Because i got the main thing covered, there's not a lot out there that's too impressive. There's people who have certain things out there, and I say, good. More power to you. Doesn't bother me. Not in the least. What I've got is eternal. Called eternal salvation. Called eternal redemption. What I've got and what you've got if you're saved, it pays off now and in the life to come. There's no way you can meet it. You can meet it if you try it all day. To say that I'm happy in the Lord and happy in the ministry, it's really beyond words. So you ever get tired? Very tired. You ever find stuff you don't feel like doing? A whole lot of stuff I don't feel like doing. You ever find stuff you don't enjoy? Much of it is not really what you'd call enjoyable. There are some things I do because of the right to do. Because of a need, maybe of a family. Not something I enjoy. You understand kind of the reference there. but Honestly, I certainly like to finish my ministry with the joy that God has given me today. If I could finish my ministry with joy such as in my heart today, I'd be doing all right. I'll simply say this, that it certainly is wonderful to be saved. And if you're here today and not saved, you're missing it. Not me. You know, you go to get saved, somebody says, yeah, but you'll miss And you know, as I look back, I say, it's been a good miss. <laughs> yeah, some of the stuff I've missed, good. There have been some things I'd hate to have missed. I'd hate to have missed Brother Danny Castle's last revival. And the one before and the one before. There are some things I'd hate to have missed in the Christian life. The Lord's been good. I'd hate to have missed fellowship and Brother Joe Williams. I'd hate to have missed hearing, what was his name? Dick Linville preach. Oh, West Virginia coal miner. That was something else. That guy hopped up and down the aisle on one foot. Tommy, he hops. You can't do it on one foot, Tom, like he does. <laughs> that guy had one lung. I mean, he just about couldn't hardly. He'd preach a while and sit down and gasp for air. I mean, he'd just sit right down there and get his air. He'd get up and go at it again. Most are still kicking around. Lord's been good. There have been some enjoyable times. When I say to you that I'm happy in the Lord, that is no doubt about that. When I say talk about drinking for the wells of salvation, I think you know what I'm talking about. But today I want to preach to you, I'm so happy and here's, you know they say, here's the reason why, you know. Alright, I'm so happy and here's one reason why. 
It's because of the judgment that I'm going to miss. When I say miss it, I'm talking about as far as standing before God and being judged for my sins that are unforgiven. I'm thankful that because of salvation, here's the judgment that I miss. In Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9 and verse number 10 there, uh, the Bible says there's the ancient of days, and the Bible says there's 10,000 times 10,000. The Bible says the judgment was set, and the books were open. And I'm happy to say that because of salvation, I might minister to him. I might have sent to something. I won't be standing there, ready to drop into hell, or in a lake of fire, because of unforgiven sin. And I'm happy today of nothing else. I mean, the main thing, when I say the main thing is right, I'll guarantee you just missing this judgment from the wrong angle, uh, that's reason enough to be happy in the Lord. Judgment's something that this world's tried to bypass. Youngsters have been taught no God with the result being no God, no judgment. And the result being things have not gotten any better, far worse. And uh, they treat everything, treat life itself, as though there is no judgment to follow. Not so. It'll be just like the Bible says. The judgment was set and the books were open. Now we're talking about some things pertaining to the judgment. And it's happy miss. If you're saved, you're just like myself. I, I'm nobody. I don't hold a corner on God. The Bible says whosoever. And that's exactly what it means. Uh, you know, I, I think of the passage here and I say to myself, oh boy, there's going to be some amazing conviction very quickly, shortly, when somebody stands before the Lord. In verse number 9, the Bible says, I beheld till the, ancient of, till the thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit. Say, what about the conviction? Number one, you're going to find out the Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. What you read here in Daniel chapter 7 matches pretty well what you read in Revelation chapter 1. A bunch of people running around these days and acting as though, I don't believe in the triunity of the Godhead. I believe in one God. I don't believe in the triunity of the Godhead. And denying the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you read here fits Revelation chapter number 1. But, aside from that, you are looking at a garment that was white as snow. Snow white, we say. The Bible says the hair of his head like pure wool. And it seems like whenever you find yourself in the presence of somebody who's snow white and somebody who is pure as a driven snow, it seems as though that conviction has a tendency to maybe smite our hearts. And if that be true with sinful man, imagine what it would be like at standing before the sinless, holy God of the universe Himself. And the Bible says there He is, and the Bible says you're uh, dealing with a garment white as snow and hair like in a pure wool. You know, there are certain people you get around and just seem like as though that you get under conviction being around him. I've had it happen. I've been around Brother Bemis and you ought to travel with him for a week. You all worry about it, you know, and I'm going to get under conviction, I'll be hitting the altar. Yeah, you probably will if you hear him preach. You ought to live with him for a week. You ought to go out to golf first and be standing there in front of the crowd there and just say, let's pray. Drop his head and start praying. Say, Lord, how come I never thought of that? <laughs> you know? One time I was around a friend of mine and uh, he told this other guy, he said, don't get around him, he'll curse you. And he was whispering when he said it. <laughs> and the friend said, he doesn't curse you, you bring a curse upon yourself. You know, sometimes just being around certain people, it sort of gives you that kind of a feeling. It has to do with the no guile. It has to do with purity of heart, mind, and soul. It has to do with somebody who their thought life is clean. Somebody tells an off-color story, they don't even catch on. They haven't thought about it maybe ever or in so long, they just they don't even know what this, what's all about. And they're telling something to go either way. You know, it's halfway respectable, but it'll go another way as well. 
They don't even know what you're talking about. That's wonderful. Imagine if somebody down here can live such a pure, clean life and think so pure and so clean that it would have a tendency to draw conviction to your heart or my heart. Imagine what it would be like standing before God and the Bible says the judgment was set, the books were open and there you are before the one who is pure as a driven snow and the Bible says garment, even his garment, white as snow. Not a spot in it. Not a spot in it. And you're before the God of the universe. He sits. You stand. And you stand to be hung out to dry. In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that heaven and earth pass away. That judgment. How'd you like to be standing before Him? Not as the song said, nothing between my soul and the Savior, but nothing between your God and a lake of fire. Nothing. Sometimes I marvel at these iron workers. Those guys go up 100, 200, 500, 600 feet and they got a beam below them. Man, I don't think I'd go up there if I had a platform below me. And some of those guys get up there and enjoy it. They like it. They like it up in the air. How'd you like to be up there standing before the God of the universe and nothing below? Say, well, how can that be? Just exactly like you're reading Job chapter 26. The Bible says He hangs the earth out upon nothing. Right there, He just hangs it out. And likewise, one by one, they come up they're hung out to dry right before Him. That's going to be quite the judgment. Quite the judgment. I heard about one of these astronauts, I think the second one uh, put his foot on the moon. And he was joking around, said it's going to be a wonderful thing if sometime shortly uh, all these people can get up there and, and they can look back at the earth from up there on the moon like I did. Well, how about somebody being beyond the moon, sun and stars, standing before the God of the universe? And there is no moon. There is nothing there. I mean, I mean, heaven and earth has done passed away. And they're standing before the God of the universe there. And the Bible says the judgment set, the books are open. And I'm going to be very thankful to miss the conviction that smites the hearts of a lost person when they stand before the one who is pure. Absolutely pure. Snow white. Without us, and the Bible says there was a lot around, and the Bible says there there were uh, thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. You might consider the congregation ten thousand. Boy, isn't that a lot? Thousand thousands. That puts you into millions. Wow. 10,000 times, I don't mean 10,000 times, 10,000. I don't know if John Kobe's uh, computer goes that far. Man, that's, a, that's way, way out there. I can't even fathom something like that. I'll just simply say the congregation, it'll be a tremendous congregation. And there you are one person before that congregation, before God, and before a congregation like that. I would say that not only will his, his hairs be pure as wool, but I would think that one standing before him with a congregation like that about to be exposed. I would think that instantly their hair as well would turn snow white from fear. You heard the story of a Sunday school teacher one time. He took his uh, took the youngsters on a, a trip. And they went uh, to some sort of a cave and they got back in this cave and as they were coming out they saw a den of man they were in a den of snakes and he had little I think beginners like six, seven, eight year old kids and he took those kids out of there and around those snakes that were at the entrance to that cave they had missed going in one by one his arms and got them out 
very meticulously and carefully without arousing that then a rattlesnakes. He got the last one out and finally got him back to safety there. And They said when he got done, his hair had turned snow white from fear. What do you think it would be like standing before the God of the universe there in a congregation such as that? I think, man, 10,000, that's a bunch. And I think 10,000 times 10,000, isn't that something? That's an amazing thing. I think, you know, Daniel chapter number 3, you read about uh, the image that's set up 90 feet high. And you read about that image there set up in the plains of Shinar. And everybody's bound down to it. You have the sheriffs and uh, the treasurers, the counselors, and, and men are just all bound down right before that image there in the plains of Dura. And you say, isn't that something? Yeah, if you can imagine some of that, that vast area. I mean, here is the big old 90 foot image there. And here are just thousands by, I'm sure, 10,000 major people. I'm talking about chief men, chief women. And you're talking about the men of stature there. And you have just bowing down before. What a crowd that must be. And yet even a greater crowd, the Bible says there, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Sometimes we think of congregation and say, wonderful congregation, boy, pretty good crowd. Last uh, Wednesday night, we sang in between praying and the Bible study. We stood just for a seventh inning stretch and we sang number 151. Guess why we sang 151? Because we had 150 plus one. Well, we like to think plus one. Anyhow, uh, we sang uh, 150, Shirley said, as the attendance last Sunday, which neither here nor there. That's good attendance for us. And we kind of enjoyed that. Before that, we had probably, uh, I would say, pushing twice that many. About a month or so ago, and Brother Danny was in on Thursday night. Man, you about had that many cars around here. Couldn't hardly get in. Somebody walked in, and they took a look around. Where am I going to sit? That don't happen around here. It's usually, where am I going to sleep? <laughs> it's been that way already. And uh, sometimes it's kind of enjoyable to have it packed out. But I'll tell you what, I will be glad that I'm on the right side of 10,000 times 10,000. I'll be glad that I'm on the side that's ministered unto Him. I'll be glad that I'm not one standing in a crowd like that to be judged for my sins. And the Bible says the judgment was... And the books were open. You consider the conviction that will smite the heart of the one that stands before God Himself. Consider what it would be like to stand just little old you before 10,000 times 10,000 to be judged of your sins. Imagine the confrontation. I say confrontation because of uh, they're not going to be in a recourse here. It's not going to be a situation where they stand before Him. And it's not going to be a thing whereby, you know, it can wiggle out, weasel a lot, buy your way out. It won't be that at all. I mean, when He calls your name and uh, you stand before Him, there's not going to be anybody that's going to be able to say, well, I'll talk for Him. Or, He's busy today. He's off working today. It'll never be that way. Maybe you've seen situations where the one that's supposedly being judged never has to take the stand. And it's not a matter of whether guilty or not guilty. It's like the system's being judged. Not the party as to whether or not they're guilty. In this particular case here, there's not going to be any recourse. I mean, if a situation, once that thing is set and the Lord calls you up there, you're going to stand before Him and there's nobody going to get you out. Years back, there was a fellow I worked with and he had shot somebody and it looked like the guy wasn't going to make it and the guy did make it. Finally, when he got back to work, he said, but it looks like I'm going to have to do some time. And they postponed the trial. Finally, came the trial came to pass. And one day, we're out there laying bricks. And I said, in the day of the day, you're supposed to go on trial? And he said, uh, yeah, my lawyer's taking care of it. Never worked the days to go on trial. Never even had to, never had to stand before the judge. The Lord took care of it. Wonder how he took care of it. 
It won't be that way. There's not going to be any recourse here. It's going to be a confrontation. God says you step before me and you're going to stand before Him. And, uh, you know, nowadays uh, the attorney does all the talking. Didn't we have like a six or nine month trial a while back and the defendant never even stood before the judge? The attorney did all the talking. At least never stood before the, the crowd that would really lay some questions out there. But there won't be any recourse here. There won't be any buddy left out. Nor will there be any sin left out. The books, the judgment will set. And the books were opened. And the books are going to tell the story. They're going to tell all the story. Not just how you have made it appear. They're going to tell the story. Imagine the confrontation with you against the Lord and the Lord opening the books. No recourse. How do you think you'll come out? Amazing thing as far as I'm concerned is that people act as though, you know, well, just, you know, just a little white lie. Do you know how that will come out the judgment bar of God? Opposite. Exceeding sinful. Exceeding sinful. Exceeding sinful. You have to look at sin just like God looks at sin. That's how it will come out. Judgment set and the books were open. You measure everything by the Word of God. Here goes the record. Here's one thing. Here's the other book. It's the Word of God. How do we measure by the Word of God? We don't measure by... There are no standards today. Nobody has any standards. There are no standards to measure by today. I mean, the standards have been thrown out. But not the Word of God. You measure by the Word of God. And the confrontation will be you up against your record and your record against the Word of God. And P.S., may I remind you that it will not only be the deeds done in the body, it will be the thoughts, and even beyond that, the imagination of the thoughts. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse number 9. No wonder when Paul reasoned with Felix and Drusilla of righteousness, temperance and judgment to come no wonder the Bible says Felix trembled said go thy way you can tell the Lord go your way I don't hear I don't want to hear this stuff you're going to hear it you're going to hear that which you have forgotten that which you treat as a little nothing everybody's doing it a little white lie or whatever it'll be measured out by the word of God when I say I'm happy to miss this judgment here, not nah, happy to miss it as far as the wrong side and say that. Uh, that has to do with the conviction that uh, that one will know when they stand before the Lord. It has to do with the congregation. It's never fun to be exposed before a crowd. And not only that, I'm talking about the confrontation. And the confrontation is you against the Word of God. And then there's another thing, and that has to do with the conclusion. It's His, isn't it? You don't judge, He judges you. And you know, He judges not according to appearance, but He judges righteous judgment. And not only that, I'm reminded of some verses in the Bible where the Lord tells them not to even have any pity. Say, well, God is love. That's right. But God is, number one, holy. God's not going to let love supersede His holiness. Men think that anything can get by because God's love. No, it's not so. God is number one holy. And because God is holy, there will come a time when He'll look at certain situations and say, Depart! Depart from me! He'll do that. You say, well, what about... He'll be like the father that, well, like a father that 
doesn't even pity. So don't pray for him. He don't have any pity upon him. He'll just judge it according to the book and according to your record and according to the Word of God. And that will be the final conclusion. It will be judged by that. The Bible says there in verse number uh, 11 there, verse number 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. His throne was like the fiery flame in verse number 9. His wheels is burning fire. I would say that when somebody stands before the Lord at that judgment, this is not some child's game. The Lord takes a look at that record there and you ever heard the ter term where somebody says, man, that triggered me. That lit my fuse. You keep reading about fire, fire, burning flame. Because somebody stands there and wants that record exposed there, that triggers the Lord. That fires him up. That lights his fuse. Well, you, read, you only read that kind of stuff about John the Baptist. And the Bible says about John the Baptist, he's a burning and a shining light. And you're willing for a season to rejoice in what he had to say. A distinct man, I mean, the guy, he, he had some fire to him. But not like this. Or Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7, 8, 9, he said, man, they defame me. They're just saying bad things about me. And, and I don't like hearing it. I, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm not going to say anything anymore. I'm, I'm shut down. And a couple of verses further. But his word was in my bones as a burning fire. I never shut up within and I couldn't no longer forbear. It's as though that I didn't like what they said and that bothered me and I'm not going to take God's side anymore. And then all of a sudden that word of God worked on him and worked on him and finally, I mean, he just exploded like a burning fire. You know what fire does? It'll simmer, simmer, simmer and all of a sudden, man, it just flames up. It looks like the Lord, He's inflamed and a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. That's the Lord. I say to myself, it's an amazing thing when you analyze the conclusion there. I mean, it's going to be the, the judgment will be the Lord's and sometimes the Lord says no go. Too late. No such thing as a plea bargain. We measure by the Word of God and by the Word of God alone. I say the conclusion here is that uh, whenever that fire stream issues forth from before him, there's not going to be some attorney saying, he made two mistakes. Won't that be a joke? And he didn't do this right. He didn't do that right. 